We can wait for more people, or we can value the time of the people that are here. And I choose the former, so we're going to wait for an hour. <laughs> no, I value your time. I appreciate you taking the time to come here. I'm sure more people will trickle in, and there's long introductions. Everybody's got to tell you who they are and what they do, and you might take a nap, but hopefully you'll stay awake and have some good educational experience. So I'm going to turn it over to Henry to do introductions, but thank you for coming to the NHLA. I am Dallin Brooks, the Executive Director, and of course we want to thank our sponsor, particularly the AW Styles contractors. So we appreciate the sponsorship and we appreciate the opportunity to talk about Hardwood CLT. Henry? There we go. Jim. Can't see you in the light. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I haven't even started my show, and you guys are already clapping, so I appreciate that. <laughs> so super excited to be here. Uh, we have a great session uh, for those coming. Um, a few months ago, I got contacted by NHL8, and basically, you know, why don't you guys come back and, and tell us a little bit more what's going on with the hardwood uh, uh, cross-laminated initiative. So instead of just being me, I decided to invite the people that really know what the hell is going on and what they're doing. So. I think this will be really cool because they're going to tell us what, what are the advancements and, and how far are we and what are the limitations, what are the advantages, and kind of walk us through the process. Um, and then will be some time for, for questions. So oh, I think that, um, you know, we have an hour, but just make sure you identify these four people. I can also help you if, if you don't have time today, uh, you don't have a chance to make questions today, you know, make sure you approach us and we can help you out and, and, and try to explain better what we're doing. So, uh, so we have uh, four panelists today. So uh, we have here on my left, we have Dr. Brian Bond, a professor and associate dean of extension at Virginia Tech. And then on my right, we have Mr. Tom Inman. He's the president of the Appalachian Hardwood Manufacturer Association. Uh, and then also on the left, on my left, we have uh, Mr. Brand Cobb. He's the chief operating officer for Texas CLT. And then finally, and that least, we have Mr. Dave Benables, uh, who is the European Director for the American Hardwood Export Council. Thank you for being here. So, uh, and for those that you still don't know how to spell my last name, that's me right there, Henry Quesada, uh, Professor and Assistant Director of Extension with Purdue University. So, happy to be here as well. So, I guess just kind of an intro before I, I hand it over to, to these guys is, uh, you know, when we talk about mass timber, cross-laminated timber is one of those products. Um, we, all, we have many others. We have glue lamps, for instance. We've been using glue lamps in back in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, I remember the first time I went to the, watch a basketball game at Virginia Tech, and, and I look up, and I look at those really gigantic glue lamp structures. I didn't know where they were, but, if, but, I, but as I was told, at some point, there was the largest spanning uh, glue lamps in the entire country. Uh, they were made of dog fur back in the 60s, and the funny thing is they have to bring them all the way from Oregon to Blacksburg, Virginia. So we, we have come a long way, and after that, uh, we learned how to glue pine, and, and now, of course, you know, we're learning, and we're being very, we're being very successful in how to do structural products using hardwood. So I think we're making pretty good progress. So all those products are considered mass timber. Some of them are new, some of, the, some of them have been with us for, for a longer time. But cross-laminated timber started a few years ago, about... 20, 25 years ago in Europe, uh, the Austrians, the Germans basically started with that concept and it has, after that it has been slowly making uh, paywits into different countries, into Canada and now of course into the US. So there is an opportunity, uh, there's a huge market, I think that's what I wanna point out. So the concept is not just about the market opportunity, it's all about the idea of using this renewable material because we can really think about as wood as carbon sinks and they can really help us in the fight for, for climate change and climate mitigation. So uh, there are some challenges ahead of us. Uh, one of the main challenges right now is that everything that is specified specifically in Canada and the US has to be, has to be used softwood and that's why we're here because we're working to try to make that, that open that opportunity for hardwood. But there's uh, current capacity. I mean, we don't really have a lot of CLT mills and, and, and every time we have an investor like Mr. Cuff that comes in forward and decided to you know, do this brave thing and, and open the opportunity, we just really applaud that because we need more of that. We need more capacity. Again, limited species, 
Uh, there's some other things in there related with building crops and policy, but that's some of the issues we're trying to uh, go over. So you've seen this picture probably a million times, and again, just kind of preaching to the choir, yeah, there's nothing better than wood. That's just gonna put it that way. Uh, and, and this is really important because it also helps us to understand you know, what type of message is the one we have to transfer to our consumers so they can truly understand how beneficial it is wood for the environment. Uh, some numbers into the market. Uh, this is just going to continue to grow. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have seen more and more mass timber buildings coming over the last five, seven years. Uh, it's not just a thing in Canada, in Europe, and the U.S. It's also coming in Australia. It's also in Japan. It's, also, it's just everywhere. Uh, and, 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 and a lot of that is because the people that understand about how to, how to make things, they're asking questions, you know, what other solutions I have besides concrete and steel, and of course, mass timber is one of them. So a lot of opportunity and what we're trying to do is how do we actually make sure that we are part of that opportunity as a hardwood industry. Uh, this is just a picture of, of, of just some, you're not gonna be able to see this, but basically it's telling us what I just told you a few seconds ago, that all the different buildings that are coming, all the different other structures, we have right now almost 1,500 of those mass timber structures in, 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 in United States. Uh, that are just out there. there are some of those are in design, some of those are finished, but more will, will, will continue to come. And again, I think that this is the time that, you know, if we, we, we really need to be part of this opportunity. So with that introduction, uh, what we're gonna do is the following. I'm gonna uh, let the panelists to come up into the podium and kind of tell us what they're doing so everybody understand what's, what's happening. Uh, they will be speaking for about seven to nine minutes. And after that, uh, we go with some questions. So. With that, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Brian Bunn. Remember, green button. Thank you, appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. Um, it's good to see the innovators in the audience, right? Very interested in the innovation and new products that are gonna be available for the hardwood lumber industry. You know, I'd like to start out with saying a, a, a thanks uh, at the beginning rather than at the end. And at uh, Virginia Tech, we have a team. It's a, it's a team of folks that are working on hardwood CLT, from folks like myself that work with primary processing and how do we produce this at a profit, to folks like Henry that are driving the engineering and, and, and supply chain-ish portion, to uh, Salish who's working very hard to get the work done, to our timber engineers, all the way to marketing, and we have an architect on board. So it's been a, a real team effort and I'll describe it a little bit more of that effort as we uh, go into the program here. Also wanna say thank you to, to all of you um, and to the US Forest Service. The US Forest Service, you may wonder what they've been doing for the hardwood industry, but they have helped fund almost every project that I'll be talking about today. They have partly funded all of our research uh, and we wanna thank them. We wanna thank AHMI for all the work that they've done and, and helping with their partner mills and supply lumber for this project other universities that we're working with, and folks from NHLA and NHLA member mills for assisting us in this project. And I hope you'll see today that, that your investment is going to pay off. Okay, so at, at Virginia Tech, we started out with Southern Yellow Pine, and we started out with uh, Southern Yellow Pine CLT research back in around 2008, 2010. You might say, why Virginia? is a predominantly hardwood state, but we have a large southern yellow pine production. At that time, most CLTs or all CLTs in, the, in North America were being made with spru spruce pine fir and dug fir. We wanted to see if it was even possible to use southern yellow pine for this product. And so we did some of the first university research and manufacture and, and uh, testing of southern yellow pine material. But of course, you sit back and you say, well, you know, a large percentage of what we have in Virginia is, is hardwoods, and how can we get hardwoods into this production line? Is it even possible? How would it be received? What would the limitations be? And so we jumped into testing to see if we could produce yellow poplar CLTs, starting out with the yellow poplars, our primary species. Now, there's several ways you can go about this. Our trajectory has been to take visual strength grading rules that are used from the American Lumber Standards Committee to grade pine and apply those to hardwoods. And why, why did we choose that path? It's because the national design specifications, there are already national design specifications and strength values for yellow poplar, soft maple, and gum already on the books for visually graded or visually stress graded hardwood materials. And so it's very easy 
or we perceived that it would be easier to move into the building codes if we followed that system. And so you can see some yellow poplar down there graded using the visual stress, uh, strength, strength grades, uh, and that is the approach that we've taken. So our first yellow poplar project was actually driven by a combination of this, our department and sustainable biomaterials as well as uh, architecture and urban studies. Uh, we had an architect uh, professor that was very interested in CLTs and actually the first uh, CLT structure made with hardwoods for structural purposes is actually in Radford, Virginia and is this train viewing platform that was manufactured in Southside, Virginia and assembled with architecture students. One of the first studies we did is we wanted to see what the ready readiness of the industry was and so we talked to CLT mills to find out what their perception of using hardwoods were and we talked to hardwood producers to see what maybe the, some of the barriers might be, right? So some typical barriers you might think of in the hardwood industry is we, you grade by NHLA grading rules, right? Which is visual appearance. What does it take to move to visual stress grade? Uh, what about the moisture content differences, right? CLT is a little bit higher moisture content than what you, what you typically dry to. What type of equipment would you need? And so we look to see if the hard, what it would take to transform the hardwood industry into producing material that would be used in CLT construction. The next thing we want to do, of course, is look to see if it was, it, there's got to be a value in it for you, right? Even if we can develop a new market, if, it's, if, it, if you can't make a profit in making that material, what's the point? And so we looked at a couple of different ways to manufacture this visual stress grade lumber to see if it would be economical. And the most economical way that we've uh, determined is to saw a mix of NHLA lumber grade on the outside of a log. So you take those face boards, you sell that on the NHLA market, or NHLA graded market, I should say. And then we grade the in interior pieces, or what you might call the cant. We saw that up into two by material that's graded for visual stress grades. And you actually come out with a higher value, a co combined higher value, than you would sawing for NHLA grade. We also looked at the opportunity to remanufacture re two common and lower grade material. Maybe you could do that at a, at a rip and, and uh, chop operation, and maybe that would provide pro profit for you. And that did not work so well, but we wanted to investigate that to see if it would be profitable. Next thing we did is we wanted to see if we could get this done on a commercial scale. And so we worked in a funded project with the U.S. Forest Service to actually get a CLT mill that manufactured Southern Pine CLTs. We took yellow poplar visually graded lumber down there, had them manufacture yellow poplar panels, sent those panels to the American uh, Engineered Wood Products Association out in Washington. We had those panels tested and had that mill certified to be able to manufacture yellow poplar CLTs under special use. Uh, APA kind of came back to us and said the data is so good, it looks so good, we think that you should petition to put yellow poplar in what's called PRG 320. And you know academics are great for throwing out on acronyms, but PRG 320 is our gateway into the building code. Right, we gotta have hardwood CLTs in the building code to make it, to, for the market to accept it and move forward with it. So the International Building Code accepts, takes the PRG 320 from APA, their standards, and, ex and adopts those standards into the building code. So our pathway is to get into this PRG uh, 320 standard to get into the building code. And so we are in that process, process right now with our partners. We have uh, petitioned to have that put into PRG 320, and we're moving forward with, uh, with that process this fall. We have a special meeting coming up at the end of October to get comments on that. Uh, current work we're doing right now is something called a hybrid CLT, and that hybrid CLT is what if we combine yellow poplar and southern yellow pine together. We have some opportunities for higher strength values, is what our research has shown with yellow poplar, so we can possibly increase the strength and reduce the weight of some of those panels, possibly also uh, having thinner panels for some of the same strength values that we have in southern yellow pine. One of the other things that you know, we often don't think about as an industry is we tend to be focused on the value stream close to us. But if you think farther down the value stream, architects are incredibly interested in hybrid panels and the opportunities of combining species for the architectural and visual uh, appearance of those products. Absolutely interested. And so Edward Becker, the architect that we're working with, is going out and asking architects around the country what their perceptions are. And the idea of having mixed species and mixed panels is absolutely uh, very, very interesting to the architects. We've done a lot of work to promote hardwoods and CLTs. You know, we've done trade journals, we've, we've worked in presentations at, at uh, uh, 
conventions like this. We put on workshops uh, with partners to try to educate hardwood sawmills what, uh, what applying those grading rules would be and what, the, what it would take to be able to provide this material to the hardwood, uh, the CLT market. Uh, and in the future, obviously for us in the future, getting, getting hardwoods into PRG 320 is our goal. Getting it into the building code and accepting the building co code is our goal. And we're, we're on our way there. And that will be the return on that investment of providing that lumber for this testing. This will be your return. Uh, we have two grant projects that we're about to start looking at producing this graded material from, from cans and also one looking at soft maple. So we're partnering with uh, West Virginia University who uses a different approach, taking NHLA graded lumber as it is, two common and three common, and making CLT panels. We're going com uh, to compare our approach to their approach on a forest service funded project and try to get soft maple into that standard. So with that, I'll uh, hand it off to the next speaker. All right, thank you, Brian. I'm Tom Inman. I'm with Appalachian Hardwood Manufacturers, and we have been engaged with the cross-laminated timber market for several years now. A little bit about us first. We're an association of sawmills and lumber distributors from the 12-state Appalachian region, and poplar is a very important species to us. So in the early two, uh, 2000 teens, uh, 2010, 11, 12, we started working with Virginia Tech as well as West Virginia University and NC State on doing research on poplar um, introductions into these cross-laminated timber markets. I know AHEC and, and David will talk about that in just a few minutes with some work they've done in the international markets. But we started working with the universities. On the research side of that, many of them were able to receive Forest Service grants to uh, do testing and do other research for poplar. We found that, you know, many of you know that poplar is a top hardwood species for us, especially in the, the eastern U.S., that um, it has been used in the past for structural applications. You don't have to go back that far, especially if you watch any of that barnyard builders uh, show that's on the DIY network. You see some of those guys and a lot of those logs that are coming out of homes that were built in the 20s or cabins that were built in barns, 20s and 30s, a lot of poplar logs were used there. So it does have some structural application. It goes back a number of years. Um, the lower visual grades, and this was what was most important in a lot of this research, the lower visual grades in HLA graded poplar meets a higher structural grade standard. A lot of the testing we did and opportunity to do some structural grade testing, we found that a two common, a three common uh, poplar board a lot of times met a number one or a number two structural grade. So depending on the market um, and where markets are going, um, that structural grade may have higher value for some of the, instead of some of the visual grade markets that some of this is being sold into, especially that, that three common board. So that came as a, a little bit of a surprise to us, a very pleasant surprise that it gives us new markets for this higher volume, uh, lower grade material. And then fourth, we found this hybrid hardwood veneered panel product that, that Brian was just talking about, that there's opportunity to use poplar with another species. And I think Brant will talk about that as well with some other hardwood mix that they're doing there to mix uh, a poplar panel with uh, maybe the first core or the second and third layers are made of poplar and there's something else on the outside that has maybe more of a face veneer to that. As most of you know, you know, poplar growth in the U.S. is great. You see the Appalachian region there and how much poplar we have, especially in the center part of the region. We are growing. This is uh, from the AHEC website. You look at the growth of poplar there that, you know, we're growing you know, seven, over seven million cubic meters of poplar growing there. We're harvesting about two million cubic meters. So look what that leaves, you know, five million in net growth there just in the state of Virginia alone. If you expand that, go a little bit to the north there to West Virginia. Again, a very positive number there for that state. And then the same thing in Kentucky. You see tremendous growth there for poplar. So we certainly have the resource and we have the mills and we have the yards that are using that resource. These are just our members in the Appalachian region that poplar is important to. So you can see the, uh, the red dots there are distribution yards, the blue dots there are, are sawmills that, uh, that poplar is important to. And so it's a very strong uh, species for our region. It has a lot of value for our region. And we think there's a tremendous opportunity, especially for this lower grade material in the region. Now, one of the things that we found to produce this structural grade hardwood lumber in our mix is that you have to consider exactly what Brian said, that there is a place for that visually graded NHLA grade product, but there is a place for the structural graded material. 
Now, most of you know a lot of it goes to a, a pallet product or it goes into some other industrial uh, market. CLT is has got to be in that mix. We've got to make the changes on the PRG 320 um, standards so that we do have opportunity to sell our material into that. You know, one of the things Henry Caseta has carried our water for a number of years on that PRG 320 committee as far as being one of the lone hardwood voices there. Well, we have quadrupled the voices this past year. There will be four of us now moving forward that will be on that committee that will be able to hopefully have influence but explain issues like this, explain the lumber resource that's available, explain the testing that's gone on to, again, to increase our likelihood of having poplar introduced uh, to start with and then move into other hardwood species, be it soft maple or others. Um, there's opportunities here to possibly remanufacture some of the thick um, stock material that's coming out and then also to resaw cants to produce a structurally graded product and then also to produce uh, yellow pine lumber, sim I mean yellow poplar lumber, similar to what's going on with southern yellow pine. Some of the testing we've done, uh, many of the CLT manufacturers are just following a softwood standard. So the dimensional lumber that they want is a, a two by four, two by six. So we don't compete as well in that because our yield goes down dramatically. On some of the early testing we did where we were cutting existing material into a, a two by four, you know, which is not a true two by four, two by six or two by eight, whatever that softwood lumber dimension was, our yield went down because we're having to meet the standard set for another type of wood. So that what we have to explain to CLT manufacturers and also on this PRG 320 standard is that let's look at the way we cut hardwood lumber. And let's look at the strength of five quarter poplar or six quarter poplar and see how it matches with the, the softwood lumber. And we win in many of those categories. The research has shown that we have the strength properties in the dimensions that we already cut to equal and in many times to uh, exceed what the numbers are, the research has shown for southern yellow pine. So it's a winner for us with an existing product we have. We just have to grade it differently. We've got to learn the structural grades for those dimensions that we already make and what that grade would be moving into a, a construction type material. And then what, the things we've got to look out for, we've got to make certain that we're not doing some things, we're not introducing some certain things that's in our lumber now, whether it be defects in the ends, because much of this is finger jointed together, whether it's got end grain knots or splits, or there's missing wood, or if there's mechanical damage. I mean, some of the things that you might get away with selling it as a frame stock product, or maybe even in some cases some pallet material, where some of that is trimmed off, we've got to make certain we're aware of that as a structural grade material so that grader is looking for those things before it's applying that particular structural grade. I say all this to say there's tremendous opportunity for us. Virginia Tech has, has been really the leader in doing much of the research. There's been extremely positive results that have come from this. Um, that Radford, Virginia facility was amazing. When that first came to us, they, the um, uh, architect that was working on that, we talked with them about you know, lumber availability there, so we were able to provide a little bit of lumber. They were able to purchase some lumber that went into that. And one of the interesting things that the city of Radford did was this was not in the building code. So they're building a public structure out of material that passed all the testing at Virginia Tech, and they were okay with that. So their city planning office and their, um, the city council there approved this material for this structure that was built without there being anything else besides the research and the information that was provided from Virginia Tech. They built this uh, in Radford, which is probably 10 to 15 minutes away from the Virginia Tech campus, and it's been um, a, very, it's a very unusual product, but it's been uh, a great opportunity for us to show people what it would look like and how it can be used and the opportunities that are there. So people are looking at that and it's been written in a number of Architectural Digest magazines and other magazines like that to introduce a very unusual project into the U.S. Now, we're looking for those next projects and of course we get pushback on the codes. We've got to have, you know, we've got to meet certain codes and we've got to get this thing introduced in PRG 320. So one of the things that we are doing as an association is we are partnering with Virginia Tech for structural grading workshops. We have a workshop coming up uh, next month in Virginia. So it's an opportunity for you, if poplar is important to you, if you have uh, graders on your lines that you would like to send to this workshop, it's about a six hour seminar that they will learn the basics of structural grading. We did this earlier this year in West Virginia and what we found to a person was every one of them realized that we can do this. This is not you know, something that's gonna be difficult to do, it's different 
than we've done before, but that NHLA grader or someone who has at least grade knowledge on your particular staff can learn how to grade by a structural grade standard. Uh, there's also can be machine graded, but they can be, uh, they can be taught they can be certified to be a structural grader, and it gives you another market opportunity for a higher volume, lower grade product to find new customers for that. So I encourage you to, uh, to take a look at our website. Um, all the information that is there on this particular meeting, come and be a part of this, at least to learn about an opportunity here for poplar today, but possibly for soft maple or other materials in the very near future. Next is uh, Brant Cobb with Texas CLT. Well, these lights are bright. Um, appreciate you letting a softwood guy show up. Um, I'm from Texas and uh, I'm a fourth generation person in the forest products industry. Um, I'm a little bit more by the numbers, you might say. I'm, I'm not in the university level or anything. I, I do, I produce things like y'all do. Um, I brought some slides of our plant to kind of show you what the processes that we went through. Um, I'm particularly proud of our plant because um, it is 100% American made. We built it. It's our plant. And uh, we're very proud of that fact. We didn't, we weren't going to wait the two years to get one out of Europe and we built it ourselves. Um, I'm also very proud of the fact that we're 100% made in America and 100% grown in America. Um, I've got pictures of the slide. This is the, the layup area for our panels where we begin. Uh, this is the applicator table where the glue is applied, very straightforward. Uh, this is the beginning of the installation of our presses. We, put our, we, we started our program in 2018. We made our first panels eight months later, and um, we've been making them ever since. Uh, this is a discharge table where the finished product comes out, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, we are certified about uh, six months after we started making the panels, we got our certification. Uh, we make three sizes, a three ply, five ply, and a seven ply by certification. We do make larger and smaller panels for engineered products. We, we definitely support the uh, inspection process and the stamp process, but more importantly, we support our customers. And when our customers come to us with engineered projects that they're stamping and they want a two and five sixteenths panel or whatever they want, we make it for them. Uh, and this is typical design. This is tilt up CLT panels in lieu of tilt up concrete panels. And most of us are familiar, we've seen the slides of apartments and hotels and banks and all the, the really high rise buildings. But in Texas, and pro properly down that part of the world, there's a huge market for tilt-up concrete structures. And concrete dominates Texas, concrete and steel. And right now, there is an eight-mile stretch of a loop around Houston, Texas. That eight-mile stretch has 2.5 million square feet of concrete tilt-up walls being installed today. It will be installed over the next 18 months. That one section of highway, our plant consumes a million feet a week, about 50 truckloads of dimension lumber a week. It will take our plant three years just to produce enough panels to do that one eight mile section of highway. So that's why the tilt up concrete business is something that we, we see an opportunity with. You can do a lot of things with these CLT panels. Uh, there's a, most of you may be familiar with the industrial use, where they're used for mats or shoring walls and things like that. Uh, that's a real big market for us. Um, also, DOD did some testing on barracks for uh, Army uh, personnel, and they, this is the uh, supposed to, it was 75 feet, it was 345 pounds of TNT exploded 75 feet in front of the barracks. Uh, no damage, the, the building swelled a little bit and went back down, um, so they were quite impressed with it. Um, we're doing some different things. We're actually pressure treating some of our CLT panels to make, uh, this is an example of a, of a bridge culvert, box culvert that we, we, we cut and made the, the, the joinery with it and then pressure treated it and put it out on the field to replace bridges and things like that. Our plan is capable of making 
up to 12 and quarter inch thick, down to two and five sixteenths, 104 inches wide, and up to 42 feet long. So we can, we can make one heck of a panel. It gives engineers and architects a real big canvas to work from and design and build whatever they want to build. Um, I always include this slide because as most people that have heard me speak before, carbon sequestration is a big issue for me. And one of the things that I stress with every engineer, every architect, every architect out there when I make presentations about CLT panels, or any wood products for that matter, wood is the only building material that actually sequesters carbon. Concrete, steel, and even plastic are responsible for releasing tons and tons of CO2 in our atmosphere, and wood can reverse that trend. There's only one way it's going to reverse that trend, and that is if we start using it. And I am not bashful to get in their faces and tell them that. For every pound of concrete they use, they release 20 pounds of CO2, minimum. For every pound of steel they use, they release over 30 pounds of CO2, minimum. When they use a cubic foot of wood, they're sequestering 17 pounds of CO2, and in the cases that I pitch, forever. I have projects that I supplied material on back in the 80s that are still being used today. There's a museum in Corpus Christi. It's made up of 12 structures, every single one of them that was built in the 1890s and 19, early 1900s. So for over 100 years, those buildings, through countless hurricanes and storms, have been sequestering carbon. So people that come up to me and talk about longevity and how long wood will last, I ask them to show me the oldest concrete structure, and you show me the oldest wood uh, steel structure, and I'll show you a wooden structure that's 200 years older. This is a picture. Some of you may have crossed this. This is I-20 corridor between, or I-10 corridor between uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans. It's 84 miles of a causeway. Most people don't even have the knowledge to know that this whole 84 miles is supported by 70-foot untreated piling. They built coffer dams, popped out the water, put the pilot in and went up with a concrete superstructure. How long will that carbon be sequestered? Forever. It won't ever. Now we're talking about CLT panels, and we're building permanent structures with CLT panels. From the very start, when I started talking to people about CLT panels, I included hardwood. I knew how important it was for builders and developers to include hardwood in their structures. And so when I went and made presentations and talked, I spoke in terms of being able to make them a CLT panel out of Southern Yellow Pine or Douglas fir or whatever species right now presently, but the future held the opportunity to start putting layers of hardwood, whether it's maple or whether it's whatever species of hardwood that y'all produce. It's important that we demonstrate to builders across this country that we can do a job that concrete and steel cannot do. And that's the truth. This building that we're in right now, I'm getting off of my sermon, this building that we're in right now can be built 100% out of wood, whether it's CLT panels, structural glue limb, or whatever. And if they choose to do that, if they choose to do that, they can build a building less expensive, more energy efficient, sequestering carbon, and an absolutely gorgeous place to work and live. And that's the story that our industry ought to be telling, and I don't care if you make hardwood, Douglas fir, southern yellow pine, that's the story. I'm sorry, I get off of my stuff. <laughs> um, I'm a, you know, we're we're going to answer questions, I know, and so I'll be around answering questions that y'all might have. Thank you. See, I told you I'd do that. <laughs> and Jane says, good afternoon. Well, wow. Uh, thanks, thank you. Um, that, was, that was quite a speech. We, we come from, I, I know, I've got to find my, how do I do the slides? Yeah, the, green, green, the green button. The green button. <laughs> um, as, as you all know, we're a communication platform. Uh, a voice for the hardwood industry in export markets. And you know, my involvement is Europe. Um, it's going back 20, 25 years. You know, we began to realize there was so much activity going on in Europe to do with construction, and we weren't part of that debate. We weren't part of that discussion or that opportunity. So 
there's been a lot of change and to hear the energy and excitement around hardwood and structural applications being integrated into the industry here is something that I've always believed and wanted to happen. So it's very good to be part of this whole communication today and an outreach really that here's a massive opportunity for the industry um, you know, in, in, in the years ahead. And um, I think one thing I would say, I'm, I'm apart from the other speakers here because I talk about tulip wood and that is what the American Hardwood Export Council does in export markets because liridendron tulipifera is not a poplar. And if you're communicating in Europe where, you know, structural mass timber CLT, you know, was pioneered originally, you know, back in the 1990s, um, poplar, European poplar is not used for structural applications. It's too soft, it doesn't have the same kind of strength. Uh, it can't compete really with softwood, so, which is what the European structural industry is built on. So we focus on tulip wood because it has a whole different set of properties. And, you know, there are poplars, of course, in the States, and, and they're known as aspen and cottonwood. So I, I think that's an important consideration because the potential here is not just for the industry and development in the US, but actually you've got a product that could be added to the export list. If these developments you know, keep gathering momentum and the industry backs it, you could be selling CLT panels very easily into Europe and to other markets around the world that are all looking at this issue now. Um, what started us off was 20 years ago, we wanted to get some of the American hardwood species into the design codes in the European standards. And so we chose the obvious ones of, of red oak, white oak, ash, which we knew to have structural properties. And we put tulip wood into the mix and got some extraordinary result because it has effectively nearer the weight of a softwood, but it's actually got strength that is more comparable to an oak. So it's a very unusual species. I, I don't think I've ever come across a timber anywhere in the world that has that kind of strength to weight ratio. And that started our whole communication about the potential of, hey, in structures, you know, hardwoods have a role. And we do a lot of work with architects. We work at the other end of the chain, not from the industry perspective, but from the, the decision makers, architects and engineers. And we started those conversations and, oh, I've gone too far. Um, in 2000, and, and it took a long time, it took 10 years, as we began to understand the potential of CLT, talking to the engineers we were working with, and we came up with our first structure in uh, CLT panels, pure CLT panels of tulip wood. And we were limited. There was no producer in Europe, though all the big producers were focused on one single species, uh, European spruce, and to disturb their production, we, we couldn't get any of them uh, to get involved at that stage. So these were made in, in furniture presses, and we were limited by a meter by a meter panels. And the architect came up with this extraordinary structure that was in the national newspapers. It started a whole debate and discussion and we also, for the first time, were able to use our LCA data um, from previous research to actually do a full life cycle uh, footprint on that structure. And that started another conversation, as Brandt and the others were, were indicating, you know, this, this ability to be a huge carbon store. And all those impacts that you see there from that whole process to build that structure um, were less than the CO2 stored in the structure when it was there. Um, it took two or three more years to persuade one of the pioneers in Europe who started CLT production in Germany in, the, in 1990, so a very early producer, to make some very large panels. We wanted, we, we, we saw the potential with the endless stair, we wanted to push hardwood CLT to, to show that it was very different to softwood CLT in terms of its potential performance. 
and that's what we did with the smile. There were 13 panels went into this. Some of the panels, you know, were over 15 meters long. And this is still, I believe, according to the engineers, Arab, certainly um, to their knowledge, the, the most hard-working, ambitious structure built in CLT, any CLT that's ever been attempted. And you know, you can. You, we were able to stand 64 people at either end um, and still that entire timber structure, which is curved in two directions, um, supported that. And the manufacturer, we learned then about the process and the limitation, of course, was the material. We were working with random tulip wood lumber Wastages were very high, so the work that's going on now in the US is absolutely critical um, to changing the access. This, this was the stumbling block, and that producer was prepared to make panels, um, but again, the raw material, getting the cost-effective raw material that was graded in the right way was the limiting factor. However, they did at the same time, because of the project we were doing, produced panels for um, a building, a cancer specialist cancer centre. The architect was the architect from the endless stair, so he knew about tulip wood. And this, to our knowledge, certainly in Europe, is the only pure, permanent CLT structure, um, which I think was opened in 2017. Um, it actually, interestingly, is clad in tulip wood as well, thermally modified, and we go and monitor that performance every year. Um, but these, these panels were designed so the outer layers ran horizontally because what the architect then did was um, use those panels. He didn't have to, to keep the budget costs down. He then didn't have to finish or put plaster or any finishing on, which he would normally do with softwood CLT because of the look not being acceptable, he got his interior finish and even the falling material uh, went into the ceiling elements. So again, this, you know, this was widely publicized in Europe and in fact globally and kept that debate very much alive. Um, we then took it to another stage because up to that point, CLT structures were largely uh, screwed together, so you couldn't take them apart. Um, if you tried to do that, they lost their structural integrity. So working with a, another architect from the UK who was focused on low-cost, modular housing, prefabrication, we made a structure where the panels were bolted together, and in that whole process, we had to assemble expertise in the UK because there's no CLT producer in the UK at the moment. Although UK has been a pioneer, UK architects and engineers have pioneered CLT use in, in Europe. Um, and we learned through that process what was needed, the, the glues, the, the finger jointing, the kind of grades of lumber. Um, we were using better grades than we needed to because that's what we could get hold of. And I, I, mean, I think the comments that have been made about being able to offer higher value to those, uh, to the lower grade production is the key to this. Um, and in that process, again, you, you see we were able to, we, we rebuilt that structure. We showed it in London originally, Victoria and Albert Museum. We took it to Madrid. We took it to uh, Milan. Um, and we were able to rebuild it, reconfigure it. And, and this whole process has been fundamental in showing the public, but also engineers and architects, just what the potential is. So hardwood is something they're thinking about. There is definitely a market if there can be a production. And it's seen as a different option to softwood. It's seen as a higher performance potential uh, product within a mass timber system. And finally, out of that, we produced a, a publication. It's available on the website. We've been using this with, with manufacturers in, in Europe. A number have done trials. But again, at this stage, the missing link is the cost-effective raw material supply in the dimensions that they need for their plants. Um, and you know, 
that is what I'm hearing today, and that's where the excitement, I think, is for us, that these two journeys are coming together. So you're, you have potential, huge potential in this market, but you've also got huge potential in export markets. Thank you. Well, thank you all for explaining very well what is your involvement and, and, and how do we are trying to advance, you know, hardwoods into this great opportunity. So I want to I wanna thank you again. I do have a couple of questions that I would like to address. I would like to start with uh, Dr. Bond here on, on my left. Uh, so since you and your colleagues at Virginia Tech had experience uh, manufacturing and, per and performing tests with hardwood CLTs and softwood CLTs, did you see um, any, any, any difference? Do you believe that hardwood CLT panels perform better than, than softwood CLT panels from what can you tell us from the performance, the, the aesthetics, the economic, all those point of views? Sure. So, um, should I stand up or the mic? I think the mic, can you hear mic me? is good. All right, very good. So, one of the things we found is that, uh, as has already been alluded to, the, the weight to strength ratio is very high for yellow poplar. And so, our yellow poplar panels produced uh, significantly higher strength values than southern yellow pine panels for the sizes that we, that we tested. Uh, and so there's a huge value there, and, and there's an opportunity that we can get a high, uh, the same strength by making a smaller panel. So there's less material in that panel, there's less weight for that panel when it's shipped uh, to be installed, and so there's a tremendous advantage there in regards to the performance for, for what we're dealing with. And in the value side, there are definitely opportunities we've demonstrated with the work that we've done and the sawing strategies that we can produce that material with the visual stress grade and come up with a higher market value for the mills that produce it. Uh, and so we can produce that material that the CLT mills need at a, at a, at a reward for the hardwood sawmills that produce it. And so there's a tremendous opportunity on the hardwood side to produce material for CLT panels. Keep in mind also that in, in, in the United States, we, it, we don't make enough softwood lumber for our residential commercial market. We import tremendous volumes so imagine the opportunities for hardwoods to be utilized to make a profit for our hardwood industry, to provide uh, materials that are potentially less material, less weight, less construction time, and produce those materials at the local market. It's a tremendous advantage for uh, our locales, our building industry, and the hardwood industry. Thank you, Dr. Brown. <clears throat> uh, I have one question for uh, Mr. Tom Inman. Um, from the supply point of view. So I guess it's kind of two, two, a two combo question. So the first part of the question is, is there, is there enough popular resource adequate for CLT? And what do you think are, is the biggest limitation for the sawmills, the, the hardwood sawmills, specifically the ones working with yellow poplar sawmills and to try to work into this, work their way into this opportunity? I, I do believe there's enough poplar opportunity there. I think the, uh, the resource is, as we saw on the charts earlier, that we do have an adequate supply for uh, new markets, especially as it re relates to the lower grade material. You know, poplar has had a very good run the last, you know, 18 months to two years. It's reached some historic highs in value, a lot of demand for that uh, one common and higher grade. But uh, even some of the lower uh, grade species have had good demand, but as we all know, there's there's cycles to those particular markets. So as we move forward, we did a, an extremely informal survey of our producer members uh, about their poplar resource and what markets they see for that lower grade material. And the majority of mills were obviously interested in new markets, but even the majority of them were interested in, in new opportunities. Are there new ways to market that product into a marketplace that has not been available to us in the past? And they were very interested in that. So we've gotten very positive uh, comments and results from the survey work we've done. And also our, our board has looked at this extensively. Many of the, the folks that you saw on that chart as far as those that donated materials for these projects are uh, Appalachian members. And they see the value um, in this moving forward. So it's, it's very positive. The change for many of the sawmills is going to be, you know, just learning a new grading standard. You know, obviously, we're at NHLA, so, you know, I understand the visual grade that, uh, that this organization is all about. But there's opportunity here for us to take an existing structural grade 
and apply it to a existing lumber product that we make and find new markets that at times will have an equal value, at other times will exceed uh, the price that we're getting in some other markets. So I think there's real opportunity there for moving product that's a lower grade that we make, that we just have to learn a different structural grading standard that can be applied and, uh, and find some you know, new ways to manage that product through the sawmill where it's captured, whether into you know, bins or wherever, how it's pulled out of that to go into these, uh, these storage areas for sale into structural grades. Thank you, Mr. Inman. And I would like to get back to my left side. And uh, uh, Brent, um, you ignite the audience with that speech. I tell you, I feel energized. And, and I think we need to understand that you're very passionate about wood, but at the same time, you're an investor, you're an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, you've been in business for, for a long time, and, and you might know the answer for this. So how do we convince more of the consumers and, and the policymakers to understand that CLT panels, wood products, in general, are key for the future of our society. What can we do? Uh, I take a multi-pronged approach. The first thing I do with every single person I contact is stress that we're talking about a product that's going to improve their product. I cannot tell you how many feedbacks of every person that we've sold our product to, they agree with that after they finish their project and they realize that their wow appeal on their project is just a hundredfold better. Um, also, obviously, y'all can tell I'm a big CO2 guy, and anybody that wants to try to have that conversation with me is gonna lose. So I also emphasize to developers, if you want to sell your project in this going green society, that you're going to build everything you possibly can out of wood, and you're only going to use concrete and steel where you need to. I build with steel, I build with concrete. I'm not against that product, but I am going to use wood every single time. Before I forget about it, I did want to share something, just um, I meant, wanted to comment on a comment. We haven't staged anything up here, so I'm listening to these guys for the first time also. One of the comments, and I'm just gonna sell from a production point of view because I know mills, I know sawmills in my life. Most CLT plants will prefer two by eights or eight inch wide boards. They'll prefer six inch wide boards. They'll go to 10 inch wide boards. They don't like 12 inch and they don't like four inch. So I just wanted to kind of share that. That's our approach when you talk about what your mill's going to yield. They'll use four inch and we'll use 12 inch, but what we really prefer is eight, six, and 10, okay? The other thing to keep in mind, when you're talking about these panels, we're talking about finger jointed material. So when you're sitting there running your logs and you're running your mill, what's the best yield for the log? I know software programs now, or you program in and you say, this is the price of this market and this is the price for this market and this is the price for this market, but what if it didn't make any difference? What if you got the same value for a two by six that you got for a two by eight that you got for a two by 10 and what you told your set works is to get me the most wood fiber? What would that mean to your bottom line? That's really the question. This, I brought this on purpose. This is the finished product. We made a panel, you know, 20 something feet long with popular. There's no doubt that it works. So the question is, do you want to, I'm sorry. The question is, do you want to participate, bottom line? And, and I think if we look at the numbers, the true numbers, you'll find that a CLT product, a board produced at a mill, is certainly, should be on your agenda. Now, ours is just but one plant. Um, the market does need to expand here in the United States. We do not need to take any prisoners. Every single builder, every single developer, every single architect, every single engineer needs to be approached today, tomorrow. And they need to be educated on how to build with our products, whether it's a CLT panel or something else. And if we do that, we're going to expand the market, we're gonna expand landowners being able to sell their timber, and we're gonna help our environment. Thank you, Brent.
There you go. All right, so David, have to go back to you on this one. Um, and uh, we were just commenting outside. You know, Europe is basically a, a one species CLT idea. It's all about spruce. And, yeah. and, and, and you know very well what's happening there. So let me ask you this question. Did you, do you think there's a future for using tulip wood and other hardwood species in the manufacturing of CLT panels and other mass timber products, maybe like glue lamps? What, what, yeah, what is your opinion I, on that? I, I think there's no doubt, sorry, can you hear me? I think, I think there's no doubt that from the conversations and the work we've done, the experiments we've done, that um, there is, there is a, you know, a growing demand from architects and engineers in Europe to enhance the timber systems, uh, the mass timber systems that they're pioneering, that's becoming more widespread. There's not just a handful of architects leading the way now. There are practices all over Europe and beyond that are getting involved in how to build timber buildings. But they are systems. Um, I've learned that over the years working with these architects. It's not about a single product. So CLT has been very important in creating you know, mass, multi-story, you know, replacing elements of concrete. But there's also other products being used in Europe, you know, hardwood LVL. Um, but particularly glue lamb as well. I think there's a whole conversation that we're involved in now around hardwood glue lamb because in Europe, everything is software driven. And of course, it takes time to build up that data, to get information into the standards. And if, if you don't start these conversations now, so the, the, there is this demand there. There's no doubt about that. Um, and just going back to what we've been talking, you know, all our work proved that against spruce, you know, tulip wood was three times, those panels were three times stiffer. And for CLT use, stiffness of the panel is absolutely key to high structural performance. So they, they can integrate hardwood elements. They wouldn't necessarily build a whole building out of hardwood, but they'll integrate those elements, um, you know, whether it's specific glue lamb or elements of hardwood CLT. So. Uh, you know, I think the Europeans, uh, probably the way it is at the moment, the first commercial applications might well come from panels made here in the US rather than panels made in, in Europe. Um, we just don't know. But we know manufacturers and engineers are, uh, with, without any doubt, watching this very carefully. Thank you, David. So I would like to use the last couple of minutes to ask the audience if you have any questions. Uh, we have one question in the back. And you probably have to scream. I'll take that. Okay. Um, the, the answer is yes. So PRG320 is the standard that, that CLT mills have to use to manufacture the product, but it's also the standard that the building code adopts. Uh, and so if, if we don't have that standard and, and yellow poplar in that standard, then anytime anyone wants to build something with yellow poplar, it's a special use and has to be approved locally and has to jump through significantly more hoops. So our goal is to get it in PRG 320, which is the APA standard for that material. Uh, you know, there's APA standards for plywood, there's APA standards for glue lamb, there's all those standards have been adopted by the building code. So once we're in that standard, the building code will, uh, the localities come in and decide to accept that in, in the building code or not. Once it's in the building code, then you don't have to jump through special hoops to get it. So we expect once we're in there to have it completely take off and open up the market. So Grant, for example, is, is probably, you know, if he was interested in using hardwoods, there's a huge leap for him to go from, let's make those things. Wow. Uh, I'm jump up here. So there's a huge jump for him as a manufacturer, not wanting to get in there because it's not in the, it's not in the building code. Once we get in the building code, it opens up the door for him. So 
that is our goal. Get, get hardwoods in the building code. We expect it to take off. Now, where are we in that process? We're actually meeting on October 20, 27th uh, with the APA and the committee to determine if uh, we're going to get yellow poplar into PRG 320. So it's happening very quickly. And then from there, it goes into the next, the next iteration of the building code. That's for the IBC in each individual state and locality decides whether to accept that year's uh, building code. Sometimes it takes a year or two for them to accept that particular iteration of the building code. So it will be in the IBC, the International Building Code, but whether your locality accepts the new edition, the 2023 edition or the 2024 edition is up to them. That's why, that's why we're getting it in there. It would, ultimately, as it moves down the line, it will have universal approval. It just takes time to be able to do that. So it happens once we're in PRG 20, 320, we get into the building code, and then it's up to the localities when they accept that particular version of the building code. So there is a lag period depending on your locality. However, that opens up the door to allow that to occur without special use. It eliminates the barrier. And, and Richard, that is our barrier now, is that we're not in that, not in the code. So if an uh, architect, as Brian said, if an architect is interested in that product, they can still do that, but they have to do multiple steps to get it approved, where this, they can look in this book now, and it's already, all those tests and all those results are there, that then they can make the decision based on that. But they, it is one more step we have to take, not only get in the code, but then the municipalities then adopt the code, and sometimes that is a one-year, two-year process before they accept the current changes. So, so Brent, I, yeah, go I, ahead. This is real, really relevant. Yeah, so. real, real world scenario. I'll call on an engineer architect building a project. We've got one going in South Carolina. Um, I pitched to them after we did this that, hey, let me do it in, in popular, you know, because I can give you a better, a different finish than what you want. They jumped all over. All they're going to do is they want to make sure that we're uh, an APA approved facilitator. In other words, we, we're already licensed to do that, and all they're going to do is change the engineering specs and go down there to the city council and get them to stamp it that they're going to be able to use popular. That's all it is. I shouldn't say, I don't try to make, I'm not trying to make light of the question, but I'm saying how we're addressing that in the real world scenario right now. We're using the spec and the fact that we can manufacture that spec, and then we're giving the engineer the opportunity to change the species of wood to what they want. And then they go down to their local building code people, and that's, an, that's a relatively easy sale for them. I think there was another question. So I'll, I'll go first and I'll let you guys see me. So yeah, so there, I think there's opportunity for gum. Uh, there's opportunity also for um, soft maple. Uh, there's opportunity for, you know, pretty much all those what we call low value timber that we have out there, we're not really using in, 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 in a property. Uh, and we just, uh, we just, as a matter of fact, we just got another, a little bit more funding. So we can start, we're gonna start working with soft maple, right? In West Virginia University. So. Yeah, so, so we need to get something first, something that, that, that we can control and something that can get us, you know, pa pave the way into what we want, and that's what we are doing. We're working with yellow popper. But, yeah, but there's other species that we will need to consider. It depends on, you know, how can you glue it or not, and, and if you can meet some of the parameters, like kind of, you know, dry it at the right moisture content, and, of course, got to be some other testing. But the, the glueability, try to put it together, is kind of a big step, and that's one of the challenges for hardwoods because all the, the chemicals in there is not as easy as, 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 as the uh, soft food side. But also that gives us the opportunity to work with some of those other chemical companies. Um, anything else? Sure. Yeah. Is, it, is it working? Yes. It's okay. Working. So the other thing is, is we, we talk about volumes, right? How much volume of gum there is, how many volume of these other species there are. But also we've we got to come back to getting the, the door open 
And once the doors open, then we can begin to move into other things. So yellow poplars help pave the way. Um, it, ha it glues using the same glues that we're using for southern yellow pine, and it's been very effective with those adhesives. And so it, it's, and we have the grading rules already and the strength values for it. And so there's an opportunity there to branch out into other species once we get into the building code. And so there, you know, who knows? Maybe 10 years down the road, a lot of mixed hardwoods are starting to go into CLT as mixed CLT panels, both within layers and between layers, which is something we're not looking at right now. But we've got to take these baby steps to get to where we can do all those things. And we appreciate all of your, your participation in providing material to get to this, because when was the last time you had a truly new market for a material that you manufacture? Truly new market, brand new market that never existed before. That's big. That's potentially yeah. huge. That's huge. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> you kidding me, right? Um, yeah, but, but the CLT panel was still competitive to concrete and steel. That's the answer you need. Even though y'all are familiar with the lumber market, y'all know what happened. I mean, I'm not, you know, so, and yet the CLT panel was competitive to concrete and steel. What was the value for MCS for lumber? Um, it got up over, for us, we'd be using number two common and a number three common, excuse me, number two for Southern Yellow Pine, it's just a number two and a number three. Uh, it got up over $1,100, $1,200, you know. But of course, we have a lot of, as, as y'all do, we have a lot of control. I'm, I'm, I'm using honest numbers with y'all. And so we got a lot of control measures. We, we never got incredibly high. Um, one thing I do want to mention, and I'm kind of going back, and I apologize. Uh, from a production point of view, one of the things, because this is not the only hardwood we've done. I'll be honest with you. We've done other hardwood. Um, from a production point of view, if I could, if I could ask for your help, um, number two common is what the CLT industry needs and a uniform width. I can't tell you how hard it is to fight mixed width bundles of lumber. So from a production point of view, if you're going to seriously, if this, if this is intriguing to you, now, do you have to go seven and a quarter or do you have to go six and a half? No. Just be consistent to one. If you're going to pick eight inches, do eight inches. If you're going to pick six inches, do six inches. The random width, ran, because you saw my layup table, everybody does the same thing. Everybody has the same vacuum lifts. Everybody has the same thing. So if you can go and standardize that. I always like to use the example, and most of you are familiar, even though you're at Softwood people, most of you are familiar with the radius edge deck board that came into existence back in 1982. That board began to be manufactured for a very specific market. Look where that market is now. Look at the volume. It's actually probably 20 years ago it began appearing on random links. And why? Because it was a product that fit a particular need and a high demand. And so all of a sudden, out of the blue, they started making a five quarter. I predict to you in this room today that there's going to be a CLT board manufactured, a board specifically manufactured for the CLT panel. It's not going to regard a species. It's going to be a board that's going to be made for the CLT panel because that's how big this market has to grow. It has that much potential. And it all depends on the people in this room and my guys down where I'm at and the West Coast folks to decide they're going to go after it. And if they do, it will change the market for the better for everybody here and everybody else in the lumber business. I'm gonna quit. Well, thank you. Um, the last thing I wanna say is, uh, I really wanna thank you guys for, for coming here uh, from different places like Texas, <laughs> from, from Europe, from, from, <coughs> from Virginia, from North Carolina, I appreciate that. And, and it's great to be in Cleveland and, and what a great audience. So you've been so great that I will give an invitation to visit at 6.30, I have a big party for you at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How about that? All right. <laughs> Just make sure you have your ticket. So thank these guys. Join me in a big, big, big round of applause. Thank you all. And one more, one more thing. You know the guys. Approach them if you have any other questions. Okay. Thank you.